Hello. May is National Historic Preservation Month in the United States, and it's a time that the Preservation Society enjoys a robust program of events and educational opportunities to really engage and connect with our membership. This year, obviously, we're having to take a slightly different approach, um, but we're really pleased to bring a lot of our traditional Preservation Month events to you virtually. Uh, we're pleased that we'll be hosting our member meeting on May 5th. Hope you can join us for that. And we have a great series of upcoming lectures uh, and discussions over the month. I wanna give a big thanks to our sponsors uh, for sticking with us through this difficult time uh, and ensuring that we're able to continue to keep up the level of programming that we've enjoyed in the past. And I think this year for Preservation Month, uh, it is really a celebration of 100 years of historic preservation. The Preservation Society turned 100 on April 21st. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, we enjoyed our 100th birthday. And so this is a great opportunity for us to do a little looking back uh, and see what we can glean and learn about the origins of preservation and how it can inform our continued work today. And I think when we have a conversation about preservation, we need to take a moment and recognize what it is that we're working to preserve and protect. Uh, Charleston is one of the most special cities in the world, and it's one of the truly great cities of the world. And it's really a composition, obviously, of fantastic historic architecture, but it's really the vibrant commercial corridors, the neighborhoods, uh, the incredible buildings that make this city so unbelievably special. One of the few benefits of the of what we're going through right now is it's provided an opportunity to really look at Charleston through a lens that we seldomly get to use and see it really in its almost uh, uncluttered uh, state. Uh, and so it's been remarkable to see the city over these past few weeks. And really uh, it's standing alone as a testament to the, the, the unbelievable beauty uh, and quality that the city has. Um, but as I said, our focus uh, is on pres preservation of the city and it's really about the neighborhoods uh, and those daily interactions that make up life in this community. When looking back uh, as a preservationist, I love to think of the 19th century version of Charleston. Thanks to 100 years of preservation, it's remarkably similar in many ways, um, at least from a built environment perspective. But I love these views that really show how the city functioned, how it operated uh, 100 and 150 years ago. Uh, and I think, you know, Charleston has always enjoyed uh, a worldwide reputation for being one of the most spectacular cities. Uh, in 1838, famed English actress Fanny Kimball penned this note back to England, uh, and it really, uh, I think, highlights uh, what we're talking about here. In addition to its incredible architecture, beauty, and history, and the people, it's also a city that has an incredible history of difficulty, fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, war, all of these have tested this city. Uh, and the Halsey map is, I think, one of my favorite maps uh, as it really shows you with uh, unbelievable detail um, where many of these events, uh, events occurred. And in sort of preparing for this, one of the things that was interesting in looking uh, at the Halsey map, as you can see, there were great yellow fever epidemics uh, and by my count, there were 15 of those. Um, and so again, these are situations that this city has uh, experienced uh, in its history. And I think when we look at this 1861 uh, view of Charleston from Harper's Weekly, uh, it really is uh, a capturing of a moment in time um, where Charleston's trajectory as a city truly begins to pivot. Um, but I love to see the buildings uh, the rooftops, uh, the, the port activity, Fort Sumter in the background. It's truly a, a, a remarkable view of the city. Um, and by pivot, obviously, the war takes an incredible toll uh, on the city itself, obviously on its people, but really the city itself suffered greatly. Um, and here you can see images. Uh, and so, you know, you'd have to imagine what it would be like to be living downtown, uh, going through uh, something like this. And right as uh, we end, exit uh, the Civil War and start to get back on track, uh, Charleston is struck by one of the, the largest earthquakes in American history. Uh, and this had to be seen as an incredible crushing blow to the psyche and morale of the city of Charleston. 
And it was in this period that really Charleston sort of suffered and, and had multiple attempts to try and reinvent itself, to try and create economic development. Um, as this is happening, you know, there is a budding uh, artistic movement in Charleston. And obviously the Charleston Renaissance is something that we all are familiar with, um, but it's so tied into the, the, pr the preservation story, uh, it's worthwhile to touch on it quickly. Uh, Alice Ravenel, UG Smith, I think is a great example of uh, the origins of preservation and, and where Charleston was as a community. On the one hand, she paints with an arguably overly romantic and nostalgic view of what the plantation and rice culture was like in Charleston. But on the other hand, is also quite progressive and shows, particularly in her art, the influence of Japanese art uh, and contemporary art. And so it is this idea of straddling uh, the nostalgia in the past, but also trying to be progressive that I think really sums up what the early preservation movement in Charleston was all about. Where she becomes most central to the preservation conversation uh, is when she worked uh, on the publishing of the Dwelling Houses of Charleston, really providing uh, a high level uh, recording documentation, if you will, of the uh, great buildings that occupied downtown Charleston. And what this did was really kick off uh, an appreciation um, or, or heightening of appreciation um, for these buildings. And, you know, and this is the time period where you have people starting to come to Charleston um, from other locations. And so we see a great influx of, of artists and residents that are drawn to this city because of this incredible architecture, this incredible walkability, these neighborhoods. Um, and Alfred Huddy would fall squarely into that category uh, and is obviously an incredibly important artist in the Charleston Renaissance. Um, but he is lured here because of the patina and the beauty that Charleston possessed. On the other end of the spectrum, you had locals like Elizabeth O'Neill Verner, a very important uh, character in the history of our organization, um, also really inspired um, by this history, but also beginning to use it as a means for promotion. Um, she was prolific and, and would sell Charleston and promote Charleston in any way she could. Uh, and this is how she supported herself. You know, and I love to see work from this period because it truly um, shows us the patina, the grit, uh, the, the character of Charleston in the 19 teens and 20s. And this is the time of Susan Pringle Frost, the founder of the Preservation Society of Charleston. Uh, Miss Sue, as we affectionately call her, came from a very prominent Charleston family. She was born in the Miles Bruton house, her family home. Um, but through the failed ventures uh, of her father um, and her family, uh, was destined uh, not for a life of luxury, but really had to enter the workforce. And so she studied as a stenographer and took her first job in 1901 to uh, work for the architect of the South Carolina Interstate and West Indian Exposition. And I love these images that show that. Um, and this is in current present day Hampton Park. And so this obviously would have given her experience to design and the process and design development. And so greatly informing her future um, path. Sue Frost was also an incredible community activist. Um, she worked on initiatives such as uh, having women enrolled at the College of Charleston. She was a central force in the suffragette movement and served as the first uh, president of the state chapter of the National Women's Party and always working tirelessly for the benefit and betterment of the community. But as she's doing this, her real passion and love were the historic buildings and was real estate. She became the first female realtor uh, and hung her shingle on Broad Street, um, which had to send some, I think, ripples through the community. Um, but she was undeterred in her uh, focus to purchase and restore and try to help uh, preserve the city that she loved. And much of her early efforts were focused in the east end of Trad Street, uh, what is now Rainbow Row, St. Michael's Alley. These were areas that had experienced significant disinvestment. Uh, and so what she would do is using her own money or borrowing family money or the money of friends, anyone that would give her money, she would, she would utilize for the cause. And she would purchase these properties and find sensitive buyers to come in and restore them 
uh, and fix these properties up. And in 1915, I believe she owned upwards of 15 properties at one time. So I think she might be considered the first great house flipper. Um, but obviously the results of these uh, efforts uh, are really seen all over the city and enjoyed to this day. But in this period, it's also uh, a period of great transition. And we talk about disruptive technologies today like Uber and Airbnb. Well, there was no technology that was more disruptive to the American city than the automobile. And so this was one of the great challenges that the city was trying to come to grips with, how to accommodate the car, how to service the car, how to uh, fuel the car. And so gas stations really were one of the primary catalysts because they wanted to be on central high visibility locations um, to be able to sell their product. And good real estate in Charleston was occupied by some of the greatest houses uh, of historic Charleston. And so one of the early efforts really centered when Standard Oil um, was set out to uh, build a filling station on the property of the Joseph Manigo house. As a result of this, Sue Frost called uh, a letter, uh, sent a letter to the paper calling on those that really are concerned about the future of Charleston and preserving the city to gather to form a society. And this was the founding of what is known as the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings, which was our name until uh, the 1950s. And I'll come back to more on that in a moment. But the Manigo House was considered one of the great uh, architectural masterpieces of Charleston built by the famed uh, Gabriel Manigo. And so as a gas station was tearing into the garden and the house was falling into credible disrepair, Sue Frost and the preservation, uh, the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings uh, put up the money uh, and were partnered with uh, Ernest and Nell Pringle to actually purchase the house. And the Pringles, uh, Ernest and Nell are an incredible story of incredible personal sacrifice to ensure the preservation of this building. They put up almost everything they had. They leveraged everything to save this building. Uh, ultimately, they were successful, but it came at an incredible personal cost. Um, and here you can see photographs of the condition of the house. Um, and even once the house was carved off, the advocacy didn't stop there. And there was continual lobbying and advocating uh, to restore the gardens, to you know, writing letters to the Rockefellers, writing letters to the city and city council, and ultimately that continued and sustained effort over many, many years, uh, Standard Oil ended up donating the property to the city, uh, and we partnered with the Charleston Museum, uh, who've been incredible stewards of that property to this very day. And so this really set in motion uh, the idea of advocacy for the historic city. Uh, and as I said, this was the, the founding of the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings. They met on April 21st at 20 South Battery and formed what would become the Preservation Society of Charleston. And it was this group of progressive uh, individuals, many of whom were local, but also uh, a large number of which were new to Charleston, that all had one thing in common, a love of this place and a desire to do something about it. Uh, and here's a photograph uh, from one of our earliest uh, membership meetings. And this is a period where I love to go through some of the minutes and understand a little bit better the DNA uh, and history of the Preservation Society. So from that May 5th meeting, our first actual membership meeting uh, in 1920, uh, 100 years ago next week, uh, the scope and aim of the society should be far-reaching, ramifying into all parts of the city and all branches of the work of preservation. And from 1928, Charleston is blessed in that we still have so many of our old buildings, and it is the aim of our society to educate the public up to an appreciation of them, rather than to have them awaken too late to the great and irrevocable loss the city has sustained in allowing them to be removed or destroyed. And another one from February of 1928. Until we have the full cooperation between the out-of-town people and home people, we will not get the results desired, which are to preserve for all time in its entirety the architecture of our city, which includes its lovely homes, its wrought iron work, its beautifully carved woodwork, its old-time flagstone pavements. In fact, all that goes to make up our city in its old-time beauty and dignity and stateliness. 
And then from May of 1928, members of our society are not opposed to progress, that we should like to see Charleston develop commercially, that we are most anxious to see industries, smokestacks, and everything that would advance Charleston commercially. But we want them properly located and not at the expense of the beauty and charm of Charleston's distinctiveness. This one resonates with me personally. And all of this is really behind and following the driving force of Susan Pringle Frost. And I think her letter to the paper in 1937 sums up, uh, I think, a lot of her beliefs and efforts. We have something that few cities in this country have. Let us safeguard it by concerted effort. Now is the time. Tomorrow will be too late. And if you're a member of the Preservation Society, you've seen this photograph probably a few times um, that, that accompanied this quote. This is an actual rendering of the originally proposed Grace uh, Memorial Bridge um, that was a, designed to land at Market Street. Um, fortunately, through multiple revisions, that landing point continued to creep its way up uh, the peninsula. And I think when we look at things that can seem daunting, like the Army Corps' attempt to build a wall around the city, it shows us that the first version is not always the best version and that we should continue to push for the best possible version of the plan. So the Preservation Society uh, and Sue Frost was known for moving on and, and trying to cover a lot of ground at once. And in 1928, really turned towards uh, the Hayward House, so the, now the Hayward Washington House, um, that was in a terrible state of disrepair. And you have to remember, this is when cities are tearing down properties like this in the name of progress. Again, partnering with the Charleston Museum um, to save this house, and they operate it to this day, again, as a uh, house museum. During the 1920s, there was a long drawn out attempt to demolish the old Planters Inn, now the Dock Street Theater. And there were, were over a course of five, six years, uh, efforts to prevent this. Um, but this also was really a turning point for the organization where Sue Frost, I think, and, and the society recognized that there was this other disruptive technology that was occurring in American cities. It was called zoning. Zoning was brand new, hadn't been adopted in many places, um, New York being the first great example. And Sue Frost was the first to think, is there a way that we can take this idea of zoning and actually apply it to preserve and protect the historic city? Well, the, the, that effort ultimately failed on uh, the Dock Street Theater, but fortunately, the advocacy to save the building did not. But what this did was put into play uh, a conversation about zoning. And when we talk about modern preservation in this country, truly Charleston was the first. And by creating a zoning ordinance in 1931, every other city and every other historic district in the country followed the example set by Charleston. So in 1931, what we see now is that these artists and these people that love Charleston were promoting it, um, that had been largely sort of marginalized by the business community and leadership, I believe recognized that, hey, there's something to this, that this could be an important tool for economic development. So at the urging of Sue Frost and the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings, uh, the city called a special committee that was chaired by the president of the society at the time, and they came up with what would be our original historic districts that you can see here on this map. And obviously over the 20th century in 1966 and the 1970s, these districts were expanded up the peninsula. And fortunately now, much of uh, the purview of the Board of Architectural Review applies to a majority of the peninsula. You know, and there are a lot of uh, projects when we go through our archives, too many to, to cover in one talk. But we can see examples by J.C. Long and the Beach Company uh, to build uh, a high-rise apartment building uh, on Meeting Street uh, directly adjacent uh, to South Carolina Society Hall, which would have demolished the house that you can see on the right. And through, again, constant advocacy by the Preservation Society and incredible support and turnout by the community to prevent this bad idea from happening, luckily um, it did not. Um, the developer then took their plans and moved over to another neighborhood in Harleston Village and, and tried to build a 14-story tower on what is the corner of Smith Street and Wentworth, again, with Preservation Society opposition and community opposition. Uh, they moved farther west to develop what would be the Sergeant Jasper building 
on the land that was Charleston's colonial common. And this is the period of tremendous urban renewal, arguably one of the most damaging programs um, for the historic city in this country. And again, it was a car driven idea of bringing interstates and parking lots in. And so one chapter that really doesn't get a lot of attention is that society worked throughout the 1950s to strengthen the zoning ordinance. And one of the great outcomes of this is that parking, garage, parking lots were prohibited um, from going into residential districts, um, which there was demand for and would have had uh, obviously a massive impact. And there's so many cities around this country that you can go to today and see the damage that was created. But fortunately, because Charleston was progressive and thinking ahead and thinking in a preservation mindset, uh, we escaped the fate that so many other cities um, fell into. But, you know, for all of the, the positives and the progress, there are also incredible losses in this period. The great Charleston Hotel on Meeting Street was demolished for a, uh, a motor court hotel, uh, motel, excuse me, uh, a loss of a tremendous building. Uh, there wasn't enough advocacy um, to, to prevent this from happening. And I would argue probably the greatest single loss to the city of Charleston architecturally, culturally, and socially was the demolition of the Charleston Orphan House uh, at the corner of St. Philip and Calhoun Streets. This was demolished in the 1960s to make way for a Sears Roebuck um, and ultimately that building still survives and serves today as the Lycee Center at the College of Charleston. Um, but these are reminders of, of why we do what we do. Uh, and for every one of those projects that burn and sort of sit prominently in our minds, there are more that we can't recall um, because you can't travel around this city and find a block that hasn't been uh, touched or enhanced or had buildings saved by the work of historic preservation. And here are a couple of examples of buildings that would be gone if it were not for the tireless advocacy for preservation in this community. And it's not just buildings. Uh, like we saw with the Grace Memorial Bridge, uh, the James Island Connector was considered one of the most important um, infrastructure projects in the city. And it'd be hard to imagine uh, the flow and function uh, and mobility aspect of the city without this project. Uh, and we think about the incredible impact and traffic that it puts onto Calhoun Street. Uh, initially, this was designed to land at Broad Street. Uh, and again, really through the tireless efforts of the community, led largely by the Preservation Society and Jane Thornhill and Liz Young, and uh, they were determined not to have this happen and worked with all of the stakeholders to have this moved up to Calhoun Street. And I just sort of have to wonder today what Broad Street would be like if the connector had put uh, landed down at the west end of Broad Street and what the impact would be on those adjoining neighborhoods. But all of this comes uh, really to uh, a big moment. Um, King Street in the 1970s was incredibly run down. Uh, a lot of vacant buildings. It was uh, incredibly disinvested. Um, the suburban flight had really eroded the core of the city. And Joe Riley, in his first term as mayor, you'll have to pardon the motorcycles, uh, one of the downsides of being on King Street. Um, but the Charleston Place Hotel was conceived of as a catalyst to reinvigorate King Street. And here's an early, um, uh, pro early design proposal. And this went to the BAR and the community was very d divided. Many felt that the economic catalyst was necessary. Uh, many others felt that the design was so detrimental and foreign to the city of Charleston that it would forever impact uh, the city negatively. And so there were lawsuits and this was a, a debate that raged on for many, many years uh, and was very divisive and the Preservation Society even had multiple slates of officers proposed trying to change um, the position of the organization, but the society prevailed in, in holding the line and calling for a better, better preservation outcome. So again, here you can see early renderings of how massive the original proposal was and how it would have really dwarfed um, the historic market. And so through continued pressure and advocacy and working with all of the partners, uh, I think when we look back at the Charleston Place Hotel today, it is really a supreme example of preservation when it works. It might not be easy to get there, but now we have a property 
that is respectful of its historic context, that was the catalyst that King Street needed, and is clearly an asset that uh, any um, firm would kill to own in their portfolio. So it was a great outcome, and I think stands as a testament to the, what we can get accomplished um, when the community gets focused. Uh, and one of the key areas on this project for us um, was that the demolition uh, of the buildings, the facades along Meeting Street, in order to accommodate a parking garage for the hotel, uh, all of the historic buildings lining means, Meeting Street were proposed to be demolished. Um, by not giving in and not holding the line, they were able to redesign the parking deck to go in behind these facades. And so every time you drive down Meeting Street and see these buildings, uh, appreciate the fact that you're not staring at a 1970s exposed parking garage. That is the work of historic preservation. So our work is obviously about the buildings, um, but it's really about the community. It's about vibrant commercial corridors. It's about livability. It's about how we make this place a great place to live now and in the future. And our work really pivoted uh, a few years ago uh, when one developer wanted to challenge the Board of Architectural Review who had turned down uh, a design for a replacement tower for the Sergeant Jasper. And unfortunately, this stressed the system and we're having to live with not only the physical outcome of it, um, but the impacts that this had on our zoning ordinance, which we had relied on for so many decades. Um, and so what happened is, is when city council settled with the developer, the BAR was completely um, recomposed and the ordinance was changed. And I would argue we have a weaker uh, ability to regulate new construction. Well, this is also occurring at a time where we're seeing unprecedented levels of investment in Charleston. And so every project we deal with starts out with a developer coming in saying, this is my allowable zoning envelope. Whereas before, the historic context would drive what that building might look like. Now it's what we call a buy right approach. And so we are having to work uh, in the opposite direction that we are used to. And unfortunately, um, some of our outcomes um, we feel are incredibly unsuccessful. This is the proposal for the Hughes Lumber site on Mary Street that our members will have seen many times now. And you know, shockingly, this building received uh, additional height awarded for architectural merit, and we simply feel that we must demand and expect better in the city of Charleston. This is not what we believe architectural merit looks like. Uh, and then there are other projects that I think we have to be cognizant of. This is the new hotel that's going in uh, right now on the corner of Calhoun and East Bay Street, and we remain very concerned about the impact that this is gonna have on that important intersection most notably its absence of ground floor activation and commercial activity. And as we all know, there has been an un unprecedented uh, level of growth in this city. Every one of these projects, the society has dozens and dozens of meetings and attempts to make these all better. And I can tell you with confidence that every one of these projects are truly better uh, than where they started. And so for us, it's thinking about what this city is going to be when it grows up, because we're growing up awfully quickly. We're in that awkward adolescence phase. But this is a rendering um, that was submitted with a project that shows Charleston in the year 2025 looking downtown. So we have a lot of work continued to do. And obviously, tourism has been a key focus. Uh, of the Preservation Society going back to the 1970s. And as we continue to burn and, and establish, you know, burn past every award there is and win everything out there, um, you know, we think now is the time to ask some questions. It's hard to talk about tourism right now because we understand that the industry and all those working it are truly suffering and our hearts definitely go out for them. But we wanna see this as an opportunity not to stop tourism, but to think about how this fits in to our economic picture moving forward, how we can create a better balance uh, between the, the tourism economy and the economy that supports those that live here. And I think there's opportunity for this community moving forward if we can ask the right questions and engage all of the stakeholders and work with the tourism industry. We have to stop seeing the essential businesses that support residents closing 
um, and being replaced by hotels uh, and galleries and, and, and businesses that cater to people who spend 48 hours in our city. This will continue to be a big focus for us. And obviously all of this happens uh, within the framework of sea level rise. Flooding has impacted everything we do. There's not a project or an issue that we have to address that we don't have to consider it within this context. And we're working hard with our community partners and, and stakeholders to try and convene a community voice around what we need to do. There is a lot going on and there's a lot of competing voices. And the bottom line is, is the community needs to be well informed uh, and involved in that decision making. And we'll be working continually towards that end. And so everything we do comes back to decision making. And when we look back at the very first edition of Preservation Progress, our magazine that we're incredibly proud of, that hopefully you'll be receiving a copy of within the next few days, uh, its initial uh, edition in December of 1956, I think sums it up best. The society's chief weapon is informed public opinion, not biased opinion, but informed opinion. And this drives our work every single day. And so whether you can log on to our website, um, whether you can get the news updates there, get our emails uh, and our communication strategies keeping you informed and engaged, or utilizing our toolkit to connect with public meetings um, or city members of city council, it is about connecting the community with the decision making. And it's also, I think for us, it's about framing the positive vision for preservation. What do we hope to see? What does Charleston want to be in 15, 20, if not the next 100 years? And so we are an organization that is very much rooted in our past and rooted in the history and architecture of the city. But make no mistake, our focus is 100% on the future of Charleston. We will continue to work with elected leaders. We will continue to engage and work with the community. And we will continue to talk about overdevelopment, over tourism, and flooding. And we believe that Charleston is at a crossroads. We have a choice to make, and we choose to fight for the future of this city. And we hope that you will join us. And let's continue to think 100 years back, what about 100 years forward? What do we want? What do we hope that Charleston will be 100 years from now? And as we do so, I ask that you channel your inner Susan Pringle Frost and think about what she stood for and the inspiring stance that she took in creating the first grassroots preservation organization and arguably the preservation movement um, as a result of that. So I think if we have an army of Susan Pringle Frosts, the preservation and the future of Charleston is looking very bright. We have lots more to come this month and hope you can join us. I hope you are well and we encourage you to stay safe and be well. Thank you.